Good morning, Church Ohana. I uh, hope you're all well. Again, wish we could be with you in person. Um, but this morning, uh, we're going to go ahead and read from Psalm 16. Uh, it is a repeat. Um, Uncle Craig read it last week, um, but it is relevant to our message today. So we're going to go ahead and, and focus on it a little bit more. I also wanted to say Happy Mother's Day. I couldn't say it any better than the kids di- just did for you on that video. But um, moms, uh, thank you very much for being who you are. Um, and uh, happy Mother's Day. Um, So we'll read from Psalm 16 together, um, starting in verse 1. And uh, I did want to say that one thing about this passage that is um, great to to focus on is that David shows a lot of confidence in the good life for those who trust in the Lord. And yet, it isn't a confidence that's done by his own doing. Uh, We can see here, starting the first two verses, that he really lays heavy on God being the one who brings um, these good things by his presence, and um, there's no good apart from him. And so let's read it together. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So let's pray. Father God. We thank you for this morning, Lord. Um, we thank you that it is because of what you have done, Lord, and your, um, your presence in our life, Lord, that we have life. Um, God, I pray that we would be aware of the reliance upon you that we need, God. Um, I pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word. God, I pray for Pastor Leo that as he gives the message, you would speak through him. God, that there would be clarity and there would be conviction in our hearts, God, of what you're calling us to, Lord. Um, We need you and we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
this morning on this Mother's Day. Um, we just thank you for what they have been in our lives, Lord. And Lord, now as we enter into a time of um, receiving a, a message from your word, Lord, I just want to pray for Leo that you can give him clearness of heart, Lord, of what you would have us to hear this morning. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, aloha, church. Peace be with you all. Uh, wherever you're at, um, in your living room, in your bed maybe, uh, we welcome you. We welcome you to our gathering, even though it's online. And I just want to apologize for the little delay that we had this morning. Uh, had some technical difficulties and um, those uh, videos of the kids were super cute at first, but as it was looping and looping, I'm sure it got a little annoying, maybe. I don't know. Um, but happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. Um, I was just telling my wife last week, um, the, mud, the word mother is just so, so misleading. Um, mothers are, not, are, are cleaners. Mothers are caretakers. Um, they are therapists and entertainers and counselors and teachers and everything, everything else. That list can go on and on and on. But most of all, mothers, you are the steady stream, the steady force of love and care for your kids. The display of the gospel in your children's lives comes from you in such a powerful way. And I know it was very forming for me, uh, from my mother, and also probably from yours. Um, and so at this time, I just want to take a moment and pray for all the mothers out there. Uh, kids, if you're watching this with your mom, uh, fathers, dads, just lay your hands on, the, on your mom, um, on your wife, and just pray for her with me right now in this moment. Father, you have structured the family. You have given family as a gift to us, as the good to all of us, to the society, and to all of us personally. Lord, and the most crucial, the most crucial relationship that any one of us will encounter is our mothers. The way you have shaped us, the way you have formed us, Lord, is just so massive and Father, I just pray for every mother out there right now, Lord. As even in this time, Lord, in this season, as we go through this um, COVID-19 stuff, Lord, the difficulties of being a mother can be even more underlined, Father. And I just pray that you would give them strength, Lord. Give them your grace, Lord. Give them yourself as they seek to train their children and discipline them in the ways of your grace and of your love, Father. I just pray you to be with every mother out there, Lord. And if there's any mothers who are, if there's any women who are listening right now and they haven't had a chance to be a mother, yet that is the desire of their heart, Father, I just pray that you would bless them with this gift of being a mother. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, well, open up your Bibles to... Exodus chapter 33. Um, this morning, we are going to cover 33 and 34. And so, open up your Bibles. I know at home it could be chill and less formal, but I would encourage you to still do that. And grab your Bible, either on your phone or the physical copy. Um, Exodus 33, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Depart. Go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out out of the land of Egypt, to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offsprings I will give it. 
I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, and the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on their ornaments. For the Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I will consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what, you, what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used uh, to take the, the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at the tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar... Of clouds standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, he, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor, favor in your sight and, your, and I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please, please. Show me your glory. And he said, I will, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim, your, proclaim you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for the man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take, my, then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come, up on the, and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself here to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds gaze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first and he rose early in the morning and went up Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hands two tablets of stone and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. And he said, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people. And pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us for your inheritance. And he said, behold, I am making a covenant. Before, before all your people, I will do marvels such as has never been, been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you, have, you are shall see the works of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. Verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down the, from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been ta- talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders in the, of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked to them. Afterwards, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord has spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Let's pray. Father, the request of Moses to show him your glory is our request today. God, show us your glory. Father, we are so blinded by the desires of our hearts, by false idols. Lord, and we need your spirit this morning to open up our eyes Open up the eyes of our hearts to see your glory. And we pray that you would move amongst us and do that this morning and right now. Lord, we have no way of grasping your beauty, God, without your spirit at work in us. So we pray for you to do that. We rely on you for the glory of your son, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Uh, This morning, I want to start by asking a question that hopefully we'll answer by the end of the sermon. And the question is this, what is the most essential thing to you as a Christian? If you were to narrow down to one thing, what would be the greatest need to you in life as a follower of Jesus? What would be the greatest thing to you? Is it moral values? Uh, Maybe it's the blessings of God in your life, physical and spiritual. Uh, Maybe it's the security of eternal life. Or maybe it's the fact that you are free from sin and guilt. Or maybe you love the community, a place to belong that God has brought you in. Or maybe something else. Today we get to discover what is the most greatest need to Moses and Israel. What is most important to them? So last week in Exodus 32, we saw how Israel, in their heart, went back to Egypt. Uh, Moses went up to the mountain, and with their leader gone, Israel retreated back to the affections of their heart. And so despite the fact that God has loved them, cared for them, and saved them, they made for themselves a golden calf, and they worshipped it as the great I am, Yahweh. And all this happened just days after they have vowed to God to keep his law and be his people. And yet here they are committing treason against the God that has saved them. And so God tells Moses, I will wipe them out completely. I'm done with them. And I will make a new nation out of you. And so Moses pleads with God. 
God spares the nation, but he punishes the people, and so many of them perish. And so that's where we left off last week. That's where uh, chapter 32 leaves us. And so we're kind of in this awkward place. What happens now? Where do we go? And so we see that the chap- chapter 33 opens up with this dialogue between God and Moses. And at first it seems as though everything's going good. Like we're back on track. God's telling them to pack up their bags, pack up the tents. They're headed towards the promised land. God says, I'll send an angel. I'll drive out your enemies that are before you. You will have your land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, I will give you all of, your, all of the blessings, and I will bless you with everything that I have promised you. Seems like great news. Everything seems, everything seems as going according to plan, except there's one problem. God tells them, I'm not coming with you. I'll just commission one of my angels to get you there, but I'm out. I'm done. And here we see the great sin of idol worship drives a wedge between God and his people. Ironically, when Israel thought that God was no longer present with them, they made a golden calf to represent God's presence. And because of their sin of idolatry, God is removing his presence. And so the plans to build a tabernacle are scrapped. Not only that, but God is not going to even, not only will God not dwell with them in the tabernacle, but from this moment on, he is not going to even go forward with them. And you can sense how God is distancing himself from them, even in how he refers to them. Throughout this whole entire book, God called them my people. God said, I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. I have brought you out of slavery. And here in verse 1, God says, depart, go up from me, go up from here, you and the people whom you, Moses, have brought out of the land of Egypt. So great is this divide that instead of building a tabernacle for God to dwell in the middle of the camp, Moses has to pitch a tent far outside the camp to meet with God. Because any association with this stiff-necked people, as God calls them, rebellious people, any association with them would mean death to them. And so to protect them, God withdraws his presence from them. And that is what sin does. It separates us from God. It drives a wedge between us and God. We see that in the garden, and we see that here in this story. And so as the news reaches the people, we read that it was a disaster to them. We read in verse 4, when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned and no one put on his ornaments. Verse 5, it says, they stripped off their ornaments. So the ornaments, most likely, most, most people, most people smarter than any of us will say that they represented different gods that they worshipped back in Egypt. Um, they brought these ornaments with them from Egypt. And so we see that they are mourning, they are devastated, they are turning away from their idols, and they are literally stripping the idols off of themselves. And so this becomes the very first sign of them repenting from their sin. And the response, this response, is very appropriate. Throughout this journey out of Egypt, God was always with them. Every step of the way, 
throughout all the miraculous moments, God was with them. He was with them with a pillar of smoke and fire. God's presence was always obvious to Israel. Yet they grew comfortable with God's presence. They, they, they took it for granted. But the thought of continuing on without God completely devastated them. They did not care that God will keep his promises. They did not care that God will still bless them and give them the land. They did not want to be there without God himself. They did not want God's blessing without God. In verse 15, Moses says to God, In If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. It's either we go with you or we don't go at all. We don't want the promised land without you. We don't want the blessings without you. And here's the thing. Every blessing, every good thing is from God. In the life of these people, in our lives, every good thing is from God. Physical blessings, spiritual blessings, they are all from him. But the blessings of God are not to be mistaken for the presence of God. We often measure God's presence in our life by the measure of our blessings. We often think that if our work is going well, if our business is going well, then God is present. If we are healthy, then God is present. If we feel good about ourselves, if our relationships are healthy, then God must be present. And on the flip side, if for some reason we have financial or issues with our health, or our relationships are troubled, we think that God has left us. Oftentimes, we measure God's presence with the presence of his blessings. And that is not true. Look at the story of Exodus. Through slavery, God was with them. Through the harsh wilderness of trouble and trials, hungry, thirsty, pursued by their enemies, In desperate situation, God was with his people. And here he is sending them off to a life of blessing in the promised land, but he refuses to go with them. You have everything you need. Go. The blessings in our life are not the measure of God's presence. Moses knew that. The people knew that. And for them, the promised land without God is not worth it. And so what if God told you? What if God asked, told all of us, hey, I'll give you eternal life. When you die, I will take you to the promised land, but I won't be there with you. How would you respond? John Piper asks, quote, If you could have heaven with no sickness and with all the friends you've ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked, all the leisure activities you've ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you've ever tasted, no human conflict, no natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there. So many Christians have no idea that God himself, knowing God, is at the center of all of our pursuits. Knowing God is the greatest treasure we can have. We all fall into this trap of being preoccupied with the benefits of knowing God without pursuing to know God. 
Knowing God brings many, many blessings with it, not just physical, but also spiritual. The blessing of being forgiven, the blessing of freedom from sin, the blessing of being adopted as his children, the blessing of being justified, the blessing of having eternal life. And these blessings are endless. We can list them forever. But the greatest blessing is God himself. Reichen says, we can't be so preoccupied with what, with what God does for us that we neglect who he is to us. And in this moment, Israel definitely realizes that. They, can have, they have everything that God has promised them, but not God. They don't want that. And so, as this relationship uh, between God and his people is growing cold, as there's a wedge being driven between them, at the same time, the relationship between God and Moses is growing more intimate. In verse 11, uh, it says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. It was just a conversation. Moses had full access to God. Moses is with God outside, of the, outside the camp in his own tent. He's just chilling, enjoying the presence of God. And so in God's presence, Moses is again interceding on behalf of the people. Uh, the first time we see this is in chapter 32. He intercedes that God would not destroy them. Uh, and then now we see that he is pleading with God that he would not leave them, but he would go with them. Moses said, Lord, the very reason we left Egypt is so that we could be your distinct people. And you, our God, would dwell in our midst. And so unless that happens, unless you dwell with us like you said you would, we won't go anywhere. And we read that Moses found favor in God's sight. And God told him, this very thing I will do. Through, this chap through these chapters, we continually see how Moses is a man that pleased God. He interceded between God and people. He was this middleman, constantly finding favor in God's sight, even on behalf of this people. And his, inner, his work of interceding, it points us to the greater and better intercessor, Jesus, who will please the Father once and for all and will intercede on our behalf. And so as God uh, promises Moses his presence, Moses, in verse 18, makes this bold move. He's like, all right, God, I want to see the ultimate expression of your presence. He says, Lord, please show me your glory. I want full disclosure. I want to see you as you are. And you can see that Moses longed to be with God. Moses longed to know God. He wasn't satisfied with, with the relationship with God as it was. He wanted more. He wanted a greater revelation of God. He says, Lord, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. We can see that this is, this is a, a very deep and intimate relationship. The reason why Moses wanted to know God is so that he would be able to please God. And God's like, all right, I'll pass before you, but you can't see me in full glory because man shall not see me and live. Even though Moses spoke to God as a friend, he was still a man, and the fullness of God's presence would destroy him. And so God gives Moses instructions on how he will pass over him while keeping him safe. And so 
Moses is on the mountain. He's getting the new tablets of law. And here on the mountain, God passes before him in glory. We don't really have a description of what Moses saw. But what is striking about this moment is what God proclaims about himself. God reveals himself to Moses. And scriptures chooses to highlight for us this great moment. And as it highlights it, 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 displ- it shows us not what Moses saw. It doesn't try to describe what Moses saw, but it describes to us what Moses heard. And what he heard is a revelation of God. And God says, the Lord, and it says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgression and sin, but those who will by no means, uh, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children of the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head towards the earth and worshiped. In this revelation of himself, God makes known seven attributes, seven characteristics about himself to Moses. Moses is saying, Lord, we don't want to, we don't want to continue without you. We cannot continue without you. Not only that, but we want to know you more. And so God gives them even more reasons why they cannot continue without him. And these reasons, these seven attributes, they become the center of Israel's worship of God. And this becomes the theme of Psalms. Even until this day, you will hear these themes being underlined in our songs that we sing. And God reveals himself as merciful or compassionate. A God who sees our weakness. A God who is sympathetic to us. A God who cares about us. Psalm 103, 13. David says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. God's heart is drawn to help us in our need. God reveals himself as gracious, which means, gracious means he gives undeserved favor. If God gave us what we all deserve, we would all be destroyed. But instead, God gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us his grace. God reveals himself as as God who is slow to anger. God is patient with us sinners. He was patient with his people. And when he does get angry, it is a righteous justice. It is not because he loses his temper like we do. No, he does not, God does not approve. He does not overlook sin, but will act against it in due time. But he is kind and he is patient towards sinners. God reveals himself as abounding in steadfast love. His love doesn't pause. It doesn't take a break. But it's an everlasting, steadfast, consistent love. He reveals himself as faithful. He doesn't break his promises. He will do what he said. He reveals himself as forgiving. Every sin committed is committed against God. And God takes our heavy burden of sin and he forgives it. He erases our debt forever. This is how God displays his glory to Moses by revealing more of himself. This is who I am, Moses. And that is what Israel needed. As they are once again, as they once again broke the covenant with God, as they realize the depth of their sin, as they repent of their idolatry, as they are weeping 
mourning, broken over their sin. They need to hear and know that their God is merciful. Their God is gracious, slow to anger. He is patient. He is loving. He is faithful. And he is a forgiving God. And church, that is exactly what we need to hear this morning. Our souls, they long for a relationship with this kind of God. A God who sees us as we are, understands our weakness, and he gives us his mercy and love. There is no blessing There is nothing in all creation, not even heaven itself, can can fill the void in our hearts that only God himself can fill, that only knowing God can fill. There is nothing that can replace knowing God. What's obvious here is intimate, As intimate as the relationship between Moses and God was, Moses could not see God in his full glory. But God came. He came to dwell with man through Jesus Christ, who is the full revelation of God's glory. What God spoke to Moses about himself, the words that Moses heard, became physical, became real in Jesus. And through his life, Jesus displayed to the sinners around him mercy, compassion, grace, love, forgiveness, and patience. The last attribute that God revealed to Moses is his justice. And this little, could be a little puzzling. Because as we hear these six attributes of God, his mercy, compassion, his love, his faithfulness, and then we hear justice. How can mercy and justice coexist? How can a just God have mercy and grace to sinners? How can God forgive Sin that demands justice. Does God sweep it under the rug? Does God overlook it? No. A lot of times, um, God is compared to a grandpa, especially by liberal Christians, a grandpa that kind of laughs at the mischief of his grandkids. He's not a father that disciplines, but a grandpa who just kind of just lets it go. That is not God. God cannot let sin go. So how are we able? How is Israel able to receive God's mercy without fear of justice, without fear of punishment? And we see this beautifully displayed on the cross where justice and mercy meet. Where Jesus takes the punishment, our punishment on himself so that we may receive mercy, grace, and love of our Father. That is why God was able to spare Israel. That is why God was merciful and gracious to them. That is why God is able to spare and forgive us this morning. Because God did not spare his son. The only way to escape the justice of God and to find mercy and forgiveness is in Jesus. This is why only Jesus himself is the most necessary and important object of our worship. He knows us completely. He knows us thoroughly. He sees the darkest corners of our hearts, yet he accepts us, yet he loves us, yet he lovingly, graciously brings us to himself. 
And it's not because he overlooks our sin, but it is because he paid for our sin. He himself experienced justice for our sin. And seeing God's glory, seeing God's majesty, his mercy, and his love, Moses bows down and he worships God. Seeing God's glory, experiencing God, Moses comes down to the mountain with his face shining. The people could not look at Moses. He had to cover his face. The presence of God, when we encounter God, when we encounter Jesus, just like Moses, we will never be left unchanged. You cannot say you've met God and walk unchanged. So I hope that this morning, the Holy Spirit can minister to all of us. The Holy Spirit can display the beauty of Jesus, that we can take our idols, take whatever blessing that we have lifted up above God himself, and that we could lay it aside and worship Jesus for who he is. Jesus doesn't just give us peace. Jesus doesn't give us joy. Jesus doesn't just give us his love, but he is our joy. He is love. He is himself our peace. He gives us himself, and that is the greatest thing that we can have this morning, church. Let's pray. Father, you did not leave us in the dark. You did not leave us dead in our sin but you have revealed your mercy. You have revealed your grace to us. And Father, this morning, that is why we are here. That is why we worship you. That is why we sing to you. That is why we lift you high. And Father, I just pray that this, will, this reality will continue throughout our lives, throughout our day, throughout our week, Lord, in all of our relationships and all of the blessings that you have given to us, Lord. We would praise and worship you and not only in blessings, but also in hardships. Father, as we experienced, uh, experienced sickness, loss, Lord, whatever people might be going through right now, Lord, may we say that you are enough. Jesus, you are the greatest possession. The gift of you is the greatest thing that we can have today and for eternity. Heaven without you is scary. You are our God, and it is you we want to worship. It is you we want to adore this morning and with all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Nope.
Day. Um, first, Happy Mother's Day. Um, we are very grateful for you, mothers. Lynn, Happy Mother's Day. Um, mother, Happy Mother's Day. Um, but now I do want to leave you um, with this blessing. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his smile upon you and give you peace now and all of your days. Amen. Grace and peace, church. You are loved. Aloha. Happy Mother's Day. Hey guys, did you know tomorrow's Mother's Day? Yeah. Anything you want to tell your mom? Yeah. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Yeah. Anything Happy you guys want? Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mama. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mama. Happy Mother's Day. We love you, Mama. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mommy. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. We Happy love you. Mother's Day, Mommy. I love, love you. you.